Hi, this is Steve. So in this section, we're going to look at a something called the copper governance. So when talking about the copper governance, there are particularly three issues that we are going to look at. So we are going to look at an overview of the copper governance. The first issue being, what is the aim of the copper governance? And after we look at the aims of the governance, we are going to look at particularly four theories that underpins the corporate governance here. And after we look at that, we're going to start focusing on the best practices that most of the companies nowadays actually adopts, yeah, in order to have a good corporate governance shown to the investors, to the company. So let's firstly kick off by having a look at the first one, which is the aim of the corporate governance. So what do I mean by corporate governance is where we're going to govern the company. So that's why, that's what I mean by corporate governance. And the aim for that is where we're going to make the directors to work in the best interests of the company, of the shareholders, in other words. For example, our shareholder, I employ you as the director to work for me. So for example, you're the marketing director. So you have to work in the best interest of me. For example, you cannot collude with the external customer to steal my money, yeah? You can't do that, can you? You cannot create a particular fake customer and you pretend that you are dealing with business with that fake customer, but instead that fake customer the bank details of that customer is the same as yours and hence what you're going to do is you're going to pretend that you are the fake customer dealing with business and taking the goods with business and write off as the bad debt you cannot do that yeah you have to work in the best interest of the shareholders in other words you have to help the company to make money yes i employ you as the director i don't want to see you stealing money yeah from my pocket. So that's what I mean by the aim of that. So we're going to have the follow the copper governance best practices. So for example, we're going to split the row between the CEO and the chairman. We're going to set up the audit committee. We're going to set up a good internal control system to prevent any of this fraudulent transaction happening within the organization. That's how we do it. But the overall aim of the corporate governance is where we're going to make the directors to work in the best interest of the company or the shareholders, if you like. And there are particularly four theories that we are going to be looking at today. So the first theory being agency theory. And after we look at the agency theory, we are going to be looking at the transaction cost theory. And then we're going to look at the stakeholders theory. And also we're going to look at the fundamental principles. Of the corporate governance. Okay, so let's kick off by having a look at the first theory, which is the agency theory. So, what do I mean by agency theory? It's simple, simple as that. So, it is the small company here. The company is so small, and the shareholder would be the directors within the company. Not only the shareholder owns the company, but actually that shareholder runs the company as well. So that's from the small company's perspective because the shareholder doesn't have much time to, uh, I mean, doesn't have much resources, for example, doesn't have enough money to employ the external directors to work for him. But as the company grows bigger and bigger, as the big company, as you can say, lots of subsidiaries around the world. 
so that one shareholder may not have time to manage all those aspects within the organization. And what the shareholders now they would do is trying to employ a lot of directors to work for him or her. So the directors namely ask the CEO, the chief executive officer, the finance director, marketing director, and maybe in some circumstances, the human resource director or information technology director as well. So they're going to employ lots of directors to work for him, but because of the word called trust, I don't trust the directors I employ because, I mean, they're not my friends, they're not my relatives, they're not my family members. And even if they're, those are the family members, maybe I lose trust on those persons yeah, that is working for me. So that here's the case. It's system for the small company, the ownership as well as the management of the company will be the same to one person. But as the company grows bigger and bigger, there's a separation of the ownership and the actual management of the organization. And hence the agency problem. actually arise. So what do I mean by agency problem is what I mean by trust problem. Because I don't trust you. For example, after employing the finance director to work for my company, I'm afraid that the finance director will, you know, create some of the uh, creative accounting, yeah, trying to steal the money from the company into his own pocket. I don't want this to happen. Yeah, but this is a problem. This is the agency problem. This is the trust problem because I don't trust that finance director. I'm afraid that the finance director will take out my money into his own pocket. So that's the agency problem. And then how we're going to tackle that agency problem is where we're going to pay for them the agency costs. Okay, is where we're going to pay for them the agency costs. So for example, if I'm going to employ directors to my company, I have to make the payment to them, yeah? I have to make the payment for them, so for example, I have to pay for them salary, have to pay for them the performance related bonuses, for example. So for example, if they have uh, made $5 million during this year, I'm going to give you 2% uh, of this $5 million as the bonuses to you. Also, I'm going to give you some benefit, I'm going to give you a nice sports car, for example. I'm going to give you the pension as well. So that's the payment I'm going to make to those directors. And other source of the agency, uh, agency costs is what I mean by monitoring costs. So what do I mean by monitoring costs, for example? I have to follow the corporate governance, CG for short, the corporate governance principles or rules, if you're in the USA, so for example. So if you're going to follow those principles or rules, for example, you're going to set up a committee, set up different committees required by the corporate governance code, that will be the extra cost for your company. So why are you going to, why are you going to follow the corporate governance? because you don't trust the directors within the companies who has worked for you. You have to monitor their performance, making sure every action, every strategy is in the best interest of the company. So that's why you incur the costs. For example, the disclosures. The disclosures of the corporate social responsibility that the company has shown to the, to the external investors, and that will be a cost for the company. Because if, if you were to demonstrate that you're, you're ethically, yeah, you, 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 you're, uh, you're ethical uh, to the public, uh, you are improving the environment, for example, you need to have certain procedures uh, to try to reduce the emissions of the carbon dioxide to the public, so to the environment. So you're going to disclose that. So from that perspective, that will be a cost for you as well. Of course, audit fee would be another source of the monitoring costs. 
Because, for example, I employed the finance director to work for me. Fine. Whether or not the financial statements prepared by that director is correct or wrong, of course, we're not sure. Until we approach to the auditor, it's up to the auditor, the independent auditor, to audit that financial statements prepared by the finance director so that I can know whether or not that FS is true or false. Okay? So those will be the costs we incurred in order to deal with the agency problem. Okay, so that's the first one, which is the agency theory. Recap of what we've done. Agency theory arises because of a word, trust. Because we lack of trust on those directors arising from a situation where the separation of the ownership as well as the management of the company yeah, actually exists. So those will be the trust problems. And how we're going to deal with those problems is where we're going to incur the agency costs. For example, we're going to pay them salary. We're going to pay them pay for them bonuses in order to motivate them to work for our company in order not in order to prevent them from stealing the money from our company also the monitoring costs as well okay so that's the agency problem we just look at the second theory we're going to be looking at is something called the transaction cost theory so let me just do right down here and there's an interrelationship between the agency as well as the transaction cost theory so let me just write down here. So, what do I mean by transaction cost theory? It's what I mean by we are incurring the costs when dealing with the transaction. Either internal transaction or the external transaction. But what does that mean? So, for example, if you are going to build a website, are you going to find a company, find a supplier who is offering uh, the website services and then you're going to sign a contract with them in order for them to build a website for you? Or are you going to employ a person to build a website for you? So, if you're going to find a particular supplier that is going to be the website for you, you have to look for different suppliers. You have to argue the prices with them. And that takes time and it's time consuming and hence, of course, that will be a cost for the company. Yes. But if you're going to uh, try to employ a person to work for you, to build a website for you, You've controlled this person to do that for you. You control the quality, etc., etc. And hence, of course, if you're going to make the second website or the third website later on, you don't have to search for another supplier if the first supplier doesn't perform really well. But rather, you can use that person to do those services for you again, so that you can feel more certain. Yeah. So this means that on the first one. If you're going to find suppliers to do that, this will increase the transaction cost of searching that kind of thing. If you're going to use the second option, surely that this would decrease the transaction cost because you feel more certain about it. But when I talk about the internal as well as the external, I'm talking about the employee within the, within the company. And also we're going to talk about the outsourcing as well. So, before we dip into that any further, we're going to look at the sources, or we can call it as the component of the transaction costs. There'll be lots of components within the transaction costs, to be perfectly honest with you, but the two main costs that we're going to mention is that firstly, uncertainty costs. And secondly, opportunism costs so what do I mean by uncertainty costs for the first one is what I mean by if you're going to look for some of the uh, supply that is going to be the website for you you have to look for it you have to argue the prices with them so it's quite uncertain that you can look for such a good quality supplier and this is not the case of course you're going to find another supplier who's going to build the website for you again that will incur you the extra costs so 
that cost associated with the researching. Because you spend time into doing that, and hence that will be a cost for you. Because you have less time to focus on the strategy of your company. Because you spend most of your time looking for different suppliers that's going to provide you with the uh, website design service. And that's not good, really. Second cost is called opportunism costs. So what do I mean by opportunism costs is that, for example, this is the first time that the directors is working for you. Oh, sorry, this is the first time that the website designer is working for you. And this means, of course, it may be a chance for that particular designer to charge you a higher price because this is the first time you work for him or her so that maybe it would be a benefit, it would be an opportunity for that particular party to earn a benefit from you. So when we're talking about the opportunism, cost is what I mean by, this is the benefit to another party. Another party may find that this is the opportunity to charge you a higher price because this is the first time we work for each other. And of course, if we can work long term, surely I'm going to give you a discount. But since this is the first time we work with each other, I'm going to charge you a higher price. So that, of course, if that is the case, that will be a transaction cost for the company. Because this is the first time we work for you, I have to pay for you more. Okay, so that's the opportunity. But if you're going to look at the transaction cost from the internal as well as the external perspective, for example, Talking about the internal bit, maybe there will be a benefit for the directors who is new to a company, yeah, newly coming to a company, but directors may try to do some sort of creative accounting, for example. Why is going to do that? Because the directors want to earn a benefit for himself. And hence, that will be the opportunity for the directors to earn the money from the company, yeah? So that's increasing the transaction costs. At the same time, external bit. For example, outsourcing options. If you're going to outsource the website redesign to a particular supplier, maybe this is the first time you work with him and then the supplier will charge you very high because they want to earn the benefit, yeah? So that by seeing this, both of them will increase the transaction costs. But you may have a question, well, Steve, so what? Well, if you're going to look back to the agency costs in the uh, first one, which is the agency problem arises so that we're going to pay for them in order for them to work in the best interest of me, yeah? So that the link between the agency costs, uh, sorry, agency, theory as well as the transaction cost theory is that for example if you are going to increase the transaction costs this means you're going to outsource it to somebody else to do that for you rather than having this particular person to work for you in the long term. So if that is the case, of course, fewer agency costs may be incurred because you're going to outsource it to someone else to, to, to do that for you, yeah? You don't have to pay for them salary, bonuses, etc., but rather pay for the one off contract pay job done. But let's look at the other side. If you are going to decrease your transaction costs, this means you want to feel more certain. First one, feel more certain. And second one, for example, you're going to make the directors within the company not doing the creative accounting. What you should do is to increase the agency costs, the cost of the payment to those directors. Yeah, in order for them to stay within the company to work for you, rather than looking for other directors to work for you, at the same time you're going to spend more money into the monitoring cost, for example. You're going to monitor that performance following the best practices according to the corporate governance in order uh, 
to prevent some of the fraudulent behaviours happening within the organisation. So that, as you can say, a decrease in transaction costs, which means the company wants to feel more certain, and hence the company will have to incur more costs into. Sorry, this is the agency. Into paying for those directors, into monitoring the performance of the directors as well. So that's the interrelationship between these two. Okay, and other argument for that is, well. If you are going to decrease the transaction costs here, this means you would like to feel more certain about doing things. For example, you've built a building rather than uh, you know rent it for a short-term lease, but rather you're going to buy it on your own, and then you're going to buy the tutors in order to run the college. So for example, you buy a building, buy the tutors, buy the books. Of course, everything seems fine. You can control everything, but at the same time, yeah, this is less risky, yeah. If this is less risky, of course the shareholder may not happen because less risky will normally mean that this will be less profit. I can't guarantee, but in most of the circumstances, less risky, less profit. The shareholders is unhappy about it, and surely those shareholders will now this would do is to increase the agency costs. For example, allowing more non-executive directors to come into the board to discuss the issues with you. In order for you to make more money out of it, yeah, make make more money out of the new strategy. So from this perspective, decrease in transaction costs, increase in agency costs. Okay, so that's the interlink between these two. So we've been sort of the first two theories, which is the agency theory as well as the transaction cost theory. And the third theory we're going to look at is called the stakeholders theory. So what do I mean by stakeholders theory is that the stakeholders theory arises from the agency theory. So let me just to point you out here. So from the agency theory, also it will lead to the stakeholders theory. So agency theory talks about trusts between. The directors as well as the shareholders. The shareholders does not trust the directors, so that the shareholder would like to pay for them lots of agency costs, etc., etc., incurring lots of agency costs. But nowadays, that we can argue that if you're going to run the business, not only you're going to focus upon the person who put his money into a company, who is the shareholders, but also you have to look after other stakeholders as well. For example. One of the typical examples for the stakeholders is called the local communities. So we get the local high quality labour from the local community. But if we are not to look after the local community, for example, we're going to damage the environments, for example, and hence, of course, this is not good because the local community will refuse. To supply you with any high quality labour anymore because you're damaging their wealth and also also health as well, so that is not good. So that's why not only、totally、going to keep the shareholders happy by making more as much money as possible, but at the same time nowadays you have to、uh, look after the stakeholders. Also, you have to look after the government as well, although you're going to. You 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 you're going to breach the laws and regulation、uh, published by the government, and hence you're going to face the penalty. For example, thirty dollars, and that is not quite material for the company for the penalty cost. Yeah, so that you're going to ignore it. But can you do that? Well, to some extent you can, but so to some of the extent you can't, because if you're going to be in breach of the laws and regulations, for example, you are damaging. Your long-term reputation, okay? So that's not good for your company overall. And hence, of course, when operating your business, not only are you going to look after the shareholders, but also going to look after other stakeholders. So what do I mean by stakeholders? Is what I mean by somebody will be influenced.
by your organization. Okay, so if you can influence some of the persons, such as the customer, supplier, local community, government, etc., etc., you can name it. So that would be a stakeholder to your organization. So should we show the responsibility to those stakeholders then? That's another question. So now the question would be responsibility. Of course, the answer is yes, particularly in the modern business world nowadays. If we can turn that responsibility into the opportunity for the organization to make more money. If we can demonstrate a responsibility to them, of course, surely we are going to look after them, yeah? Of course, we're going to tell you about how to demonstrate this corporate social responsibility later on in the section. So that's the third theory we just look at, which is the uh, agency transaction costs versus the stakeholders theory. The final theory that we're going to look at is the fundamental principles that the organisations has to follow in order to have a good corporate governance within the organisation. So let's talk about the fundamental principles here. The particularly eight fundamental principles that we're going to mention today. So first principle being integrity. So what do I mean by integrity? Is that not only people will have to follow the ethical standards. They cannot lie to others. Also according to the IFEX code of ethics, we'll have to be professional, we'll have to be competent, etc, etc. So we have to stick to that particular code, for example. We have to be ethical men. Not only we're going to do that, but also talking about the system. It has to be integrate. Okay. So, for example, how the system can be integrated is that the system is reliable. For example, if you are go you're the shareholder, if you are going to invest your money into my company. But subsequently found out that there's a you know, not enough segregation of duties within a company, which means you put my put your money into my company, your money may be stolen by some of the employees within our company. And hence, of course, you're not going to invest your money into my company anymore. Yeah? Because you don't trust our company anymore. Because our company is not integrated. Not only for the people it's not integrated, but also for the system it's not reliable. It's not operating your money. Is not to utilize your money to make more money for you, yeah, so that you're going to refuse to, to, to invest your money into my company. The second principle being fairness. So, what do I mean by fair? It's normally I say to my students, life is unfair. But how can be fair? Well, we are going to cheat the stakeholders equally so for example if you're a customer you buy the courses here I'm going to give you this discount fine but after I've given you for example 5% of discount by subsequently you notice that I subsequently have given 50% of discount to another student of course, you're not happy about this, yeah? Surely you're not happy about this. And hence, of course, you may not be our customers anymore because you lose trust into a company. Because I only give you 5% but I give another student 50%. So that you're not happy, you're not going to be a customer to our uh, institute anymore. So that's what I mean by fairness. So we're going to cheat the group of stakeholders fairly. That's the fundamental principles. Uh, for the corporate government, but also you can you can argue that 
For example, you're going to uh, show that you're ethical by trying to disclose your social, corporate social responsibility to all of the stakeholders. You're not going to hide the information into your company, but rather you're going to disclose this information to the public, making your company more transparent. And hence, that will be the third of our fundamental principle is called transparent. So what do I mean by transparency? It's what I mean by you're going to disclose the information to all stakeholders. But maybe to some extent that you can argue that if I'm going to disclose all of this information to a competitors, of course it's not fair for the company, it's not good for the company at all. Because the competitors may copy this information and would like to use this information to attack our company, for example. And hence, that's not good. So for the transparency, we are referring to mainly for the disclosure part. For example, the chairman within a company should disclose the information of a company into the chairman statement. And that statement should be transparent, showing all of its issues that is within the company so that it may be fair for the shareholders to make the decisions of whether or not to invest their money into our company. Okay, so that's the third fundamental principles. If I'm going to follow those principles, of course, that would be good. That would be good for our company's long term. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The fourth fundamental principles is called judgment. This means because we are the directors within a company, yeah, we build a system for the company. Why are we going to do that? It's because we want to make money for the shareholders who we'll put this money into the company. So that's why we build a system for them and then we generate information from those systems. So the judgment means from a director's perspective, we should have been given necessary information To make the decision. Okay, so that's the judgment, and also we talk about another principle is called property. We can call it as the honest day. So, I say to you. Firstly, we look at integrity, which means we cannot lie to others. But now I talked to you about the honesty. Also, I mean that you cannot lie to others. But here is referring to that firstly, you cannot lie to others. But secondly, you're going to have the solution. You're going to find out what's going on. For example, somebody is stealing the money from the company, for example. The accountant is stealing the money from the company, fine. Because you're the CEO of the company, I'm the shareholder, so when I notice this issue, this issue from the company, because, I, be, because recently I, got, I, 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 I went to the company and I noticed that somebody is stealing the money from our company by looking at his account. So I'm going to come to you, say that, CEO, have you noticed do you know who is stealing money from the company? Because you don't know about it at all, yeah? This is a truth, so you're going to tell me that, I don't know, sorry, I don't know. But if you add, this is the full stop, this is not acceptable. Because you're the CEO, you're responsible for the overall yeah, system within the company. You're making sure that intellectual system is sound, and hence, Although you don't lie to me because you don't know about it, but if you haven't found out who is stealing the money from the company, etc., etc., making sure that the intellectual system is sound, of course, it's not. You're not honest. Yes. So that's what I mean by poverty or honesty. You can use the uh, interchangeable word. Also, we're going to talk about something called independence as well. So, what do I mean by independence is what I mean by 
there should be a segregation of duties. There would be separate person doing things. For example, we are referring to as mainly for the auditor, for example. So, auditor is going to audit that the financial statements were not their true and fair. That financial statement should be prepared by the accountant. I can't say that the auditor prepares the financial statements. And subsequently audits it. And surely, if, if the auditor is going to do that, of course, that will be maybe the familiarity threat, the self review threat, for example, to objectivity. So, the independence is what I mean by objectivity. You can use the interchangeable word if you like. So, this means we're going to use the separate person to do the things. Secondly, it means that we need to stick to the standards. There's no point that you prepare the financial statements not based upon the acceptable accounting standards in your country. Okay? If you're not going to uh, stick to that standard when preparing the financial statements, this means that your financial statements will be wrong. And hence, it's not independent. Means this is not trustable. You can use the interchangeable word if you like. Independent is what I mean by objectivity, it's what I mean by uh, trustability, or you can call it as trustable. Whether or not it can, be, it can be trusted by the shareholders within a company, so because if you stick to a standard, you're independent, yeah, because you're the person who, uh, who audits the financial statements, who prepares the financial statements, not necessarily the person who sets the standard. So that, of course, the financial statements you're going to prepare for, if it is fulfilling the standard, if fulfilling the accounting standard, of course, that will be trustable by others. Okay, so we talk about integrity, fairness, transparency, judgment, honesty, independence. And the final two I'm going to talk to you about is the accountability. As well as responsibility. So, what do I mean by accountability? It's what I mean by a word called promise. For example, the director is accountable to the shareholders, promised the shareholders to make $500 million during the year. That's the accountability of the directors to the shareholders, yeah? because I promise you to give you $500 million. And then I'm going to delegate this accountability into different responsibilities. This means who is going to make this $500 million? Of course, I'm going to delegate, for example, to a marketing department. You have to start a couple of projects and uh, have to make maybe $400 million for me. And then I'm going to delegate the finance department another $100 million for me because please invest my money yeah, within the company into some of the short term securities etc to earn the extra income for our company. So I'm going to delegate this promise, this accountability into different responsibilities to different departments within the organisation. Okay, so that is the um, difference between these two. And normally for the accountability, it will be presented into the account. For example, uh, chairman. Chairman is responsible for the shareholders. For example, I'm going to be responsible. I'm, I'm holding accountability for you to give you five hundred million dollars. I'm going to take this down into the chairman statements. For example, that's one way that we can demonstrate the accountability here. Okay. So. That's it. So those are the fundamental principles behind the corporate governance. It, sim it simply means if we are going to follow those principles strictly, surely that the corporate governance of this organisation is good. And if the corporate governance uh, of this organisation is good, and surely we can make more money for the shareholders. And hence, of course, we can attract better investment from different shareholders outside the organisation. Okay, so that is the 
aim of the COP governance as well as the theories of the COP governance. And the third thing we're going to look at in this overview uh, of this paper is where we're going to look at the best practices as well. So how are we going to uh, you know, make sure that the corporate governance within the organisation is good or bad, we're going to follow the best practices. And I always say to my students that there would be five best practices that we're going to follow, nothing more. Okay, so the third one being, we are going to define the board of directors as well as the roles of each of the directors making sure that our directors, including the executive as well as the non-executive directors, are working within the best interests of the company. Also, we're going to look at different types of board in the third section later on when we come to it as well. And secondly, not to, we're going to set to this board, of the, uh, board within the company, but also we're going to make sure that board is effective. They're actually working. So we're going to look at the performance of each of the directors. If they're performing really good, of course, they can stay within the company. If not, they should leave the company, for example. And thirdly, we're going to look at how to build a good internal control system. So what do I mean by internal control system? It is the system to prevent something bad from happening and encourage something good to happen. For example, I need to have that internal control system in place. For example, if I'm going to buy a raw material to an organisation, one of the internal control procedure would be to get the quotation from different suppliers before you buy it. But you haven't got that quotation from different suppliers and you subsequently buy it. This means you're running a very, very high risk that the raw materials may not be in good quality and, and also the prices will be too high for the company to purchase. And hence, the internal control objective for the organisation is to make sure we spend less money to buy the good quality material. And hence, we need to have this system or the procedure if you prefer, namely, get the quotation from different supplier before we purchase it. So that's what I mean by internal control system. Of course, we're going to look in uh, look into that in much more detail when we come to it. And also, the, for the fourth one, we're going to look at the payment to those directors within the organisation. And this is also what I mean by remuneration within the organisation as well. So, I said to you, in the first theory, which is the agency theory, is we're going to pay for the directors because we're going to incur the agency costs, such as the remuneration fees, such as the payment fees to those directors in order for the directors to work in the best interest of the shareholders. Yes, and hence in this particular section, we're going to follow the best practices according to the corporate governance code. We're trying to say by how much we should pay for those directors so the directors can be motivated to work in within the best interest of the company. Also, what sort of components that we're going to pay for those directors in order for the directors to work in the best interest of the company as well. And the fifth one is where we're going to deal with the shareholders' relationships. Because the shareholders employ our directors to work within the organisation. And we have to communicate with those shareholders whether or not our company is operating effectively, whether or not there will be some of the, some of the problems occurring within the organisation and uh, you know, uh, have to uh, give you notice yeah, before it goes wrong. And that will be very, very important for the organisation as well. So we're going to look at those best practices in turn in the next of our section. So in this section, we finish off the overview of the corporate governance. We just talked about the aim of it and the theories of it. Also, the best practices overview of it as well.